the Central Arctic Oceans Fisheries Agreement, CALFA, a historical landmark agreement and probably one of the greatest environmental diplomacy successes since the Arctic Council. But what makes it so interesting? Over the coming 45 minutes, you'll be listening to a slew of experts coming here, sharing the amazing, the unique design of this agreement. You'll be hearing about how it's built on two fundamental approaches, the precautionary principle and ecosystem-based management. You'll be hearing about its unique governance structure, about its research and monitoring systems which are integrating in indigenous knowledge and Western science. I could not agree with the accolades around this agreement more. It is amazing the potential that the CALFA could have. And it's up to us now to make sure that we actually meet the challenge of the CALFA and make sure that the best parts of this agreement actually become implemented. Because this is our chance to make sure that we can get fisheries in the Central Arctic Oceans right. But what I think is actually even more interesting about the CALFA is the opportunity and the promise it could have beyond the fisheries sector. Because the CALFA is actually an opportunity for us to think a little bit about how we want to do business in the Arctic. Can the CALFA, with ecosystem-based management integrated into it, how can it contribute to developing a network of representative, protected and conserved areas across the Arctic for nature and people? How can CALFA teach us more about how we can be using our resources more sustainably, protecting the ecosystems, but also protecting the rights of the people that are dependent on these resources and the ecosystem? If we get this right, the CALFA can help us not only protect fisheries and get that right, but it could also be an important pilot for us to how we can try to create a more holistic, integrated governance tool for the entire ecosystem of the Central, Central Arctic Oceans and other pressures that we'll be entering. Thank you. I am Antje Buizis, the director of the Alfred Wegener Institute, Helmholtz Center for Polar and Marine Research. Dear participants of the panel on Central Arctic Ocean Changes and Consequences, it is only a few days that I'm back from an expedition to the Central Arctic Ocean. With our research vessel Polar Stern and the helicopters, we covered over 3,000 miles to study ice and ocean conditions of summer 2023. We deployed buoys, robots, and cameras to address the status of life under the ice, which cannot be detected by remote sensing, but requires presence at sea. We found that a change in the patterns of the transpolar drift caused the ice in a huge part of the Eurasian basin to be strangely devoid of life and to lack melt ponds to carry no sea ice algae. Connected to these ice dynamics, we also found considerable changes of seafloor life in over four kilometer steps. How do we know that? Because by international collaboration, we maintain just a few time series in the Central Arctic Ocean to address the endemic biodiversity. The changes observed are so rapid that we need a sense of urgency and ambition to improve the protection of this fascinating environment from pollution including by CO2 of the atmosphere and ocean, and by persistent chemicals. And we need to train the next global generation to recognize the immense beauty and value of a healthy Central Arctic Ocean. Welcome, everybody. My name is Mass Fredriksen. I'm from the Arctic Economic Council, and we have prepared quite an amazing session for you guys, together with Kobri from Korea, that you will hear a lot more about later. We started this session on the Central Arctic Ocean Fisheries Agreement with Vicky Lee Valgren from WWF actually telling us why this is important. And I just want to say, because Vicky reminded me before we started, this is obviously not a diversity panel. Um, so my apologies for this, but there has been a lot of changes in the last minute. Um, together with COPRI, and this is the Korean Polar Research Institute, we have put together quite a, an amazing program. So we will talk about the Central Arctic Ocean Fisheries Agreement. You will hear from scientists, you will hear from policymakers, you will hear from NGOs, companies, and indigenous groups. So let's do the, let's do the W's of, of 
what is this agreement? So I'm not going to answer it because all these people will answer what this agreement is. So why is this agreement here? Um, because the ice is melting, you see the climate stripes up here. Um, we all know that climate change happens much, much faster in the Arctic region, but we don't know what hides behind the Central Arctic Ocean. So where are we talking about? So if we talk about the Central Arctic Oceans, we actually have to move away from harbor and we have to move up here. So this is the area that we are talking about. Who is involved in this Central Arctic Ocean Fisheries Agreement? I mean, many of the parties involved are actually sitting here on stage, and you will hear from most of them soon, and there are also observers, where WWF is one of them that we started to hear from. And then finally, how? I mean, how are we going to do this program for the next 45 minutes? We're going to do it with very quick presentations, some videos, and hopefully some time for questions and answers in the end. And this is very much of a tasting menu. We're just going to touch the surface. And we will talk about how the agreement has changed the Arctic, or will change the Arctic in many ways. And we, the first speaker to tell why this is important is from AMAP, from the Arctic Council Working Group, is Rolf. So Rolf, the floor is yours. Thank you. The Arctic Ocean, a vast body of water surrounded by land, surrounded by eight Arctic states and several indigenous groups, of, uh, all benefiting from the services that the ocean provides. The Arctic Ocean has for the last 5,000 years been covered by sea ice. This blanket of ice has allowed us all to sleep well by ensuring stable climate conditions for both the Arctic and its neighboring areas. Ocean con oceans contain more than 50 times more CO2 than the atmosphere and 19 times more than the land, land biosphere. The Arctic Ocean punches above its weight, though consistent of only 3% of the water's world's so ocean surface area, it ac still accounts for 5 to 14% of the total CO2 uptake. However, the Arctic Ocean is changing. The Arctic is currently warming three to four times as rapidly as the global average. And parts of the Arctic has temperatures have already raised six to eight degrees since 1971. Six to eight degrees. That definitely sets the 1.5 degrees Celsius Paris Agreement into perspective. This has impacted how the Arctic Ocean looks, acts, and behaves. Since 1978, half of the sea ice extent in summer has uh, disappeared, and the area lost approximately equals the size of India. Multi-year sea ice is disappearing, and there's a growth in the frequency, intensity, and duration of marine heat waves. This is further accelerating the melt of sea ice as well as of nearby glaciers. Serving us with the CO2 uptake has not come without a cost for the Arctic Ocean. Turning CO2 into carbonic acid has caused the pH to have dropped to levels harmful for calciferous organisms important for fish stocks. And while we may see the Arctic Ocean turn corrosive within a few decades, this will take centuries to repair. There's a good chance for seeing summers in the Arctic Ocean occasionally being ice-free by the 2040s. And there's also good evidence that only keeping within the 1.5 emission scenario will save the Arctic Ocean as we know it as today in the long run. Thank you. First, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to provide my video message uh, to this important event. The CAOFA is unique and significant in many aspects. Let me state two of them today. First, it is precautionary. Unfortunately, negotiations of fisheries agreements often begin only after problems such, such as overfishing occur. However, the key feature of this agreement is that all countries involved agreed to a precautionary international commitment before such event happens. Another significance is a major role played by science. Because of a proactive nature of this agreement, understanding the current and future status of the Arctic marine living resources is crucial for making the right decisions. In addition, the Arctic marine ecosystem is changing at the scale and speed never witnessed by us humans. 
science has a mission to capture this change. Although Japan is located outside the Arctic, we have been engaged in extensive research and studies on the Pacific Gateway of the Arctic Ocean for many years. Although the current Japanese fishing industry has no intention of expanding into the Arctic Ocean, Japanese scientists, on the other hand, have the desire and experience to actively contribute to Arctic science through international cooperation. Thank you again, and I wish you have a productive meeting. Thank you. What you just heard here in the back and also when you came in was actually sound recordings from the Central Arctic Oceans that COPRI did just a few weeks ago. Um, so just to say there's already a lot of research going on in the Central Arctic Ocean. Also the drawings you see here is from a Korean artist uh, that we have facilitated uh, together with, with COBRI to get these different paintings. And this shows the different species moving up north. We now have the burning platform. We clearly know there's an issue, and there's an issue we have to deal with. And some people have seen this many, many years ago. And one of the people that actually saw this and said we needed to act is Ambassador Bolton. So I would like you to take us back in time of, you know, what was the idea, what was the plan, and how was it possible in a very short time? So Bolton, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks very much. You know, I have already been involved in discussions the last two, or two days here at the Arctic Circle Assembly in which the agreement has come up, and weirdly it has been both oversold and undersold in a couple of ways. So actually I think what I'd like to do with the time I have is correct the record a little bit. I want to talk about two things the agreement is not, two things that the agreement is, and one thing that it might be. The first thing that it is not is a panacea. It does not solve all the problems of the Arctic. It doesn't even solve all the problems of the Arctic Ocean. It prohibits one human activity, unregulated commercial fishing in one specific area, the high seas portion of the Central Arctic Ocean, an area roughly the size of the Mediterranean Sea. It also creates a program, joint program of scientific research and monitoring. That's what it does. It's not bigger than that in and of itself. The other thing it is not is it is not permanent. I heard somebody say that earlier today. It has an initial duration of 16 years from the time it entered into force. After that, it will be extended automatically in five-year increments unless any of the parties object to the extension. So it is not permanent. It was not negotiated with permanence in mind, necessarily. Here are two things it is. And the first thing relates to what Georgi Marishta just said. It is the best example I've ever seen in international law of the precautionary approach in action. The nine nations and the European Union that negotiated, signed, ratified, brought the agreement into force have effectively prevented a potentially serious problem before it happened. Again, I can't think of another example quite as compelling as that. It really, it really was something unusual. And I think, to answer your question, Matt, about what made this possible, it was the history of fishery management failures that preceded this that I think prompted the governments in question to do what they did. The other thing that it is, is the best example I know of in a binding interna international agreement of requiring the incorporation of indigenous knowledge and providing for the participation of indigenous peoples in its implementation. Um, I spent a lot of time working in the Arctic Council, and the Arctic Council also does a lot of that. But this is in a binding agreement. And I think it is, uh, it was, uh, if not the first, at least certainly one of the first to do that. And it was made possible by the fact that representatives from indigenous communities in at least three of the negotiating states came to the table and made the case for this powerfully and ultimately successfully. Here's the one thing that the agreement could be, and this is also was touched on by a couple of the speakers that came before, particularly Vicky. 
it could be a model. The way in which the diplomacy worked, the fact that it included both Arctic and non-Arctic states, indigenous peoples, the European Union, um, the way it dealt with precaution, the way it incorporated indigenous voices, I think is inspiring and could be a model for how we move forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. So if, you, if you wonder who these parties are, you see them on this drawing up here, the 10 parties, and as we heard from Ambassador Bolton, the European Union is one of these parties. So that actually means that Spain or Italy or, or elsewhere, many other states suddenly have an interest in the Central Arctic Ocean fisheries. And to explain why the EU has an interest in the Central Arctic Ocean, I have invited uh, Miguel, so you will explain the EU's role in, in this agreement. So the floor is yours. Indeed, and um, it's uh, quite uh, interesting the idea to, you know, you can think that this agreement is not only 10 parties, it's 9 plus 27. So the, the EU representing 27 member states, 27 countries in Europe that have a long history and tradition with the Arctic. We know that there are places in the Arctic that, you know, bear the name of uh, Europeans, uh, the Barents Sea, um, Spitsbergen, uh, and for example, Franz Josef Land. Those are just uh, examples of, of the tradition and, and the connection of Europe with, with the Arctic. But most importantly, the EU and the 27 member states agree fundamentally with the objectives of the agreement. We want to help prevent unregulated fishing in the Central Arctic Ocean. We want to apply a precautionary conservation and management measures, and we want to safeguard a healthy marine ecosystem in the Central Arctic Ocean. Because the Central Arctic Ocean is not uh, excluded or is not independent from the rest of, of the world, it's connected, and we need to understand what's going on there to also understand how climate change is impacting other regions. So we know that climate change didn't originate in the Arctic, it's impacted and affected by the Arctic, but we also need to understand how climate change is impacting the Central Arctic Ocean so we can also take that information, that knowledge into the bigger picture, the global picture of climate change and how we need to address it. And a third point why this is important for the EU is, and the Member States is because the agreement represents the basics of multilateralism and a rule-based order. And I think that this is a very good example of how dialogue and cooperation can really achieve a long-lasting agreement that can benefit a lot of people. The Central Arctic Ocean is one of the last frontiers, knowledge frontiers in, on Earth, and uh, it's a very rare opportunity for a precautionary approach, as Vicky and as uh, David mentioned. So here we have an opportunity of doing things different and potentially much better than we have done in other places and do so including indigenous peoples, local knowledge and doing it in a more inclusive way. This we also hope will be an inspiration and we want to stress that as also David said that the agreement will not last forever so we have a very tight uh, schedule and that the joint program on scientific uh, research and monitoring um, is already started and the EU is contributing heavily to that. There is a very famous um, expedition, Mosaic, that the EU funded that helped, you know, give a little bit the idea of the species you saw before. And it's also part of our EU Arctic policy. So we are committed in, in this policy to seeing a good and, and thorough implementation of the agreement. And, and this is why we are committed. We are 100% in because we do care about the Arctic. Thank you. Thank you. And as I said, this event is only possible because of the work that the Arctic Economic Council, Arctic Circle have done with COPRI. So what would the next few speakers we will hear from, first we will have a short video greeting from the Deputy Minister from, from Korea. Then we will hear from Ambassador Park, who was very lucky to get here despite the storm. And then we will hear from a scientist and, uh, and a good friend of mine, Chul Shin from Kobri, who will talk a little bit about the scientific challenges, because I'm not saying you make it sound easy, but just we have a lot of work ahead of us. 
Um, so we will hear about all of that. So first, let's hear from the deputy minister. 반갑습니다. 대한민국 해양수산부 해양정책실장입니다. 중앙 북극해 공해의 건강한 해양 생태계는 우리 모두가 함께 지켜나가야 할 대상입니다. 이를 위해 한국은 카오파 협정에 참여하고 있으며 이 협정을 통해 북극권과 비북극권 국가들이 함께 북극해의 지속 가능한 내일을 그려나가고 있습니다. 한국은 앞으로도 세빙 연구선을 활용하여 북극해를 모니터링하고 연구 성과를 공유하며 카오파 협정의 이행을 위해 적극적으로 기여하겠습니다. 오늘 행사를 통해서 카오파 협정의 의의를 공유하고 앞으로의 과제에 대해 의미 있는 논의가 이루어지기를 희망합니다. 감사합니다. Good afternoon. Um, ambassador for Polar Affairs of the Republic of Korea. Uh, first of all, thank you for giving me this uh, wonderful opportunity to be part of this uh, interesting and informative uh, session. To begin with, let me express, emphasize two pillars of our uh, policy towards Central Arctic uh, Ocean Fisheries Agreement. First, we adhere to the cause of protecting the Arctic uh, environment by using marine living uh, resources in a sustainable manner and maintaining a healthy marine ecosystem. Second, we are committed to making constructive uh, contribution to the Arctic governance as a reliable uh, partner. Looking back, the timely implementation of CAFA was a success. That is by no means easy. Many people have called it an unprecedented achievement. CAFA entered into force in June 2021. Uh, there were two tasks at the time that should be done within two years and three years after CAFA's entry into force. Uh, and first and foremost, in order to uh, meet this deadline, conference of the parties uh, had to be held promptly. However, we faced two challenges. The first one was the COVID, uh, of course, the pandemic, it was still spreading at the time. And the other one was the geopolitical tension that emerged early uh, last year. Despite these challenges, we were able to implement CAFA on time. The first COP, uh, COP was successfully held in Korea in October last year, with 10 countries all attending uh, in person. Along the way, uh, Korea as a host country conducted several rounds of bilateral uh, consultation and facilitated a close uh, communication between parties along with COP chair in a way that promotes uh, trust, mutual trust. Uh, with the success of the first COP, the second COP was held more easily in June this year in Korea. I believe that the trust uh, was reflected in the decision to hold a third COP in, again in June next year in Korea to overcome uh, the difficult situation that still remains. Uh, lastly, I want to uh, stress that the common will of the 10 uh, parties to work together uh, to build consensus has been a key factor in the timely implementation of CAFA. Thus, this process will surely succeed and Korea's com uh, commitment will remain unchanged. Thank you. Can I get people to see crab and squid? That was the original plan. <laughs> okay. Now, these creatures are what the Korean scientists came across and caught just past August. Obviously, something is going on in the Central Arctic. From the time when humankind first called Arctic home, we have never witnessed this much sea ice lost in the Arctic. And today, this decline in sea ice 
continues at a truly frightening and mind-boggling rate. Now, the Central Arctic Ocean has become a stage of science programs and policy discussions while remaining as a place of significance to many Arctic residents. The Central Arctic Ocean Fisheries Agreement means a lot to science, but it also presents us with a great deal of homework too. The challenge lies not in complete lack, in, lack of knowledge, but it lies in the scarcity of information and poorly archived or yet to be archived information. There, has, there, is, there are a fair number of science initiatives in operation, often national ones, that can be mobilized to tackle this issue. However, can this CAOFA initiative sheave all the strings of efforts into a powerful and cohesive stream? The science community needs to react proactively and with a sense of urgency. Good news is that science bodies under CAOFA auspices have, begun, have been formed and begun to work. One of the core pillars involves mapping and monitoring of the ecosystem. Another key focus lies in maximizing the data usage by fair exchange and mutually beneficial sharing. Now, here comes another challenging aspect. While some may consider it premature and improbable, there remains the potential of exploratory fishing, fish of test drive nature that might take place in the waters poorly charted. We will need to be well prepared in advance. The spirit of this agreement dictates the parties to allow such activities, even though at a marginally low level, only when the parties are able to properly examine the proposals and establish a regulatory framework supported by sound reasonings. Here we arrive at the final piece of the puzzle. Combining science and indigenous knowledge may not be a common combination, but the agreement clearly asks for it. These distinctive knowledge systems, each with its own history of development and methods of accumulating and consolidating information, must find a way to collaborate and to go forward. As illustrated in the images above, this is a collaborative venture that requires active participation of all parties. Imagine assembling a jigsaw puzzle where many pieces must fall into right places to understand the greater picture. When the puzzle gets completed, therein have to be navigational guides, reference points, and perhaps images as, signify, as signified in the initial in the puzzle. It is about building upon a balance, and it is about building up a balance. It is unique approach, and we can hardly find the best practice elsewhere in the world. This means we are poised to become a success story that can serve as a benchmark for others to adopt and to adapt from. Thank you. So you heard about some of the challenges, and I mean also just the challenges of putting together these 10 parties doing, I mean, the past three years, four years, try to look back and say what, what, what Korea has helped uh, to facilitate and, and Kobri. And also we heard about many pieces of the puzzles. And one of the pieces of the puzzles is also China is also one of the pieces that are important. And we will now hear from Ambassador Gao about China's role in the Central Arctic Ocean Fisheries Agreement. The floor is yours. Thank you. And I have the picture with the polar bear chairing the meeting. <laughs> You'll be home. All right. So that picture reminds me of one of the sessions happened uh, in this city in a beautiful and elegant white building chaired by uh, David Burton. Just, uh, not, not, not this one. <laughs> Just standing at the way, sitting at the, at, at, the, at the location where 
Yeah, where this polar bear stands. <laughs> and uh, with Canada on my right, Nordia, and all the rest are on the same and correct position. So, so it, it gives me a great pleasure to talk about this uh, uh, wonderful agreement. So we are witnessing a fast uh, sea ice melting uh, in summer, and it's been uh, uh, predicted that an ice-free summer would come by the middle of the century, or even earlier. So the marine ecosystem also gets influenced by climate change. Uh, a tendency shows that many fish stocks migrate, migrate to the north, uh, giving the Arctic Ocean the possibility for commercial fishing. So in the, in the meantime, our knowledge on this uh, wide ocean and the so-called fish resources uh, is uh, so uh, limited. Uh, and it, the uh, white ocean uh, and, uh, and its unique and uh, vulnerable ecosystem is so, it's so uh, uh, in, in risk. So potential high seas fisheries in the Arctic Ocean calls for joint attention and uh, uh, coordinated actions uh, based on a precautionary approach. Uh, as an important stakeholder the, uh, in the Arctic affairs, China took part in the drafting of the agreement in a constructive manner. Uh, after six rounds of, of uh, negotiations in, in a number of years, we have gradually stepped step to consensus and successfully uh, concluded the agreement, showing a firm determination to the conservation and the sustainable use of fishery resources in the high seas of the Arctic Ocean. Uh, Ambassador, and, uh, Ambassador and I, and a number of participants here, including Joji uh, of Japan, uh, presented here today have been part of the process. So the conclusion of the agreement is, uh, uh, is a major progress in rule making and international governance in the Arctic. So it is a successful practice of cooperation between the Arctic states and the non-Arctic non states, or say uh, in some, for some of, uh, of the non-Arctic states, we are observers uh, to the uh, Arctic Council. So directly relevant to the subject matter, it has great significance for regulating high seas fisheries uh, in the Arctic Ocean and Arctic governance at large. So this is a very innovative way to deal with uh, challenges facing, uh, facing the Arctic. So I, in, in that sense, I uh, would uh, like to thank uh, our leader, yeah, uh, David Bolton, in so many years. Thank you very much. So we have heard from policymakers, we have heard from NGOs, we have heard from scientists, but they are also two, I mean, super important stakeholders. We have heard more about one than we heard about the other. So the next two speakers, we will hear first from the private sector. So we heard Ambassador Gao mentioning sustainable fisheries. That's a part of it, as well as preservation. And um, this is not going to happen tomorrow. And we also heard about indigenous groups, and we will finish with Herb and from ICC, who will talk about the indigenous people's role in all of this. But as I said, I'm from the Arctic Economic Council. It would be silly of me not to put a company on stage. And if you just walk around here, you will actually be able to see a company over here called Brim. And we are lucky to have the CEO of Brim here, who will just give his um, kind of inputs to you know, the private sector, who is not one of the parties to this agreement. How do they see the Central Arctic Ocean Fisheries Agreement? So the floor is yours, Commandeur. Ladies and gentlemen, um, First, as someone who has been in the fishery sector for nearly 40 years, I want to use this opportunity to welcome the signing of the Central Ocean Fishery Agreement in 2018. The Arctic will be an important contributor to constantly growing demand for food and protein. My experience tells me that it's, it is in the best interest of all stakeholders to agree on the framework for resource management 
a sustainable fishing of the marine stock in the Arctic. For over 80 years, the fish stocks and the ocean around Iceland were exploded without such a framework with a result of overfishing, the most important species, are running the Icelandic fishing industry into nearly bankruptcy. In Iceland, we, we reacted some 40 years ago, firstly by claiming the right to govern our uh, fishing within 200 miles from the coastline, and secondly, by introducing a fishery management system of total allowable, allowable cuts based on assessment of the stock status. The results are clear by now. We both managed to develop sustainable fishing grounds and profitable fishing industry. These chances did not come easy. There were disputes and hard decisions had to be often, uh, taken often with the unpleasant consequences for the communities, communities fa and families. But we took the right decision. This management system is working. It took nearly 25 years for the industry to turn the operation into a sustainable economy business. And for the last 10 years, the Icelandic fishing sector has been growing, going from strength to strength and has been able to invest in innovation, contributed significantly to the society at large, and now able to meet the challenge of the climate changes. In my view, we should learn from the experience when developing the Central Arctic Ocean Fishery Agreement and the ways to manage the, to ways to manage the area. Our experience tells us that we need a system where total allowable cuts is divided by quotas to the countries that are parties to the agreement. A solid framework, a good system, will serve the long-term interest of all parties much better than constant fight for the large share. And I was just thinking about that when I hear from the big countries in the world, and I come from a small country. So I say, uh, from my experience, it is better to have a smaller slice of a cake that gets bigger than a large slice of a pea pie in the sky. My advice to the government and the politician is simple, just do it. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Alan Haney. I'm the General Secretary of the International Council for the Exploration of the Sea, ICES. Thank you for inviting me today. ICES brings together thousands of scientists every year and approximately 150 expert groups. Scientists and other stakeholders come to ICES from our 20 member countries, including all of the Arctic nations in CALFA and from around the world. ICES provides science-based advice to governments and intergovernmental organizations about how to utilize and conserve the marine environment, including on fishing opportunities throughout the North Atlantic and the Arctic. ICES also has a state-of-the-art data center that integrates a wide variety of data sources, including information from research surveys across the North Atlantic and the Arctic. The data center constantly evolves to include new data sources and improve data quality and access. The joint ICES Pisces PAME Working Group on Integrated Ecosystem Assessment of the Central Arctic Ocean, WG ICA, is expanding our knowledge about the Central Arctic Ocean and the human pressures that impact it. We don't know as much as we need to, but we have a framework for our expanding knowledge. Many WG ICA members are active in CALFA scientific activities. As you watch this, I'm in Seattle at a workshop focused on improving the inclusion of indigenous knowledge in the work of WG ICA. ICES has contributed to the development of CALFA, and we are pleased now to be an active observer. This is a perfect partnership as it builds on what we do best, from science to data to advice, at a crucial time and location. The integration of scientific knowledge, indigenous knowledge, and local knowledge in CALFA represents a unique opportunity to more inclusively utilize ICES Network's scientific capacity and processes. We look forward to working together with the parties of the agreement to expand our knowledge to support a sustainable future for the Central Arctic Ocean, Arctic citizens, and all of us. Thank you to everyone who is contributing to the agreement and for participating today. Have a great meeting. So Alan Haney just mentioned indigenous knowledge as being important, and we heard that we see this in the puzzle as well. It's about putting together everything we know to understand the Central Arctic Ocean, and who knows the ocean better than the indigenous peoples and the people who have been living by the oceans for so many years. Now we have Herb from ICC, and straight after Herb we will hear from the COP chair, Nadia Buffard from um, 
from Canada who will, who will finish off this before we open up for questions and answer. So Herb, the floor is yours. Kainani uh, Mads, uh, good day everybody. Uh, all my, all my colleagues here, I've uh, Herb Nakimayak from Minnewood Circumpolar Council. Uh, during, the, uh, the, during the phase of these negotiations, I was put in, I think, in maybe 2015, but we saw it all the way to the end. And, you know, and, and, and I would have to say thank you to all the colleagues. You know, some days we had tough negotiation, negotiating days, and, you know, some days we didn't agree. But, you know, we, we get to the point where um, this actually, this model is respectful of Indigenous people. Um, you know, we, even though the, the Central Arctic Ocean line is 200 miles offshore, we are adjacent mm -hmm. to it, what happens in the Arctic Ocean certainly affects us as Inuit and uh, our livelihoods, because we do, we do monitor, um, we, now we monitor ships and everything through the Northwest Passage, and, you know, into the Arctic. So we have proven models of research um, that, that we've been, you know, dri driving with our, our ways of knowledge, our Indigenous knowledge holders working with science to ensure that we get the best possible data at the best possible time. And uh, just so you know, you know, there's data on certain species. Anyway, we'd have 50 years of beluga data, which is the longest data set in the world. When you think about that, and you know, we and our knowledge systems have have really helped us um, monitor the health of beluga whales because we, we through Canada, we we I think we harvest about 2,000 whales across Inuit Canada alone, and I can just only speak for that because. When you harvest that many um, whales out of a healthy, healthy population, you look at the, you look at the, you know, the, the, the age, you know, the health of them, because we, that's, for us, that's a, a, a model of, of, um, of monitoring our own health, too. So what we consume is, is, uh, is nutritious and important to us. And, and we are rights holders, you know, um, Inuit are rights holders, um, Indigenous people. We, 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 we have 180,000 Inuit around the circumpolar world. And if you not include us in anything, we may not allow you to come and work in our, in our region. So relevant research, but at the same time, respectful engagement from all parties. And uh, we got here. Um, we got here, you know, when, when you have good, good engagement from parties, it's so key. You know, it's amazing what you can do because we, like, as I mentioned before, our research models have really guided us to where we are today. We've been here for thousands and thousands of years. I recall one scientist said, oh, there's no data, uh, there's no, no knowledge of, around the Central Arctic Ocean. We're like, hey, there's thousands of years of indigenous knowledge. Why not listen to us and work with us? And they have. So uh, you know, what do we do? Um, you, in, indigenous knowledge must be recognized in its own right. And it only strengthens partnerships between countries, between, between science and, and knowledge holders. Uh, you know, in this with the parties, we have a clear path forward. For any, we, we, we need to make sure that we are involved in this uh, as we move forward in the next, uh, as, as, as Ambassador Bolton said, um, you know, when does this stop? But we need to ensure that we, anyway, are actively thinking down the road so that we are included in, into this agreement and we want to ensure that we implement, uh, that the parties implement it properly and, and respectfully according to, to, to us as anyway. I know I'm running out of time here, uh, but at, at the end of the day, um, uh, th this, this agreement is a, tes a testament to, 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 to um, you know, engagement like no other parties. You know, some other oceans are wiped out and then they realize, oh, there's no fish. But here, we're actually, you know, putting in um, some measures in place to ensure that um, our livelihoods are protected. And, uh, and for us, that's one of the most important things. And I'm looking forward to working uh, with everybody um, as we move on with this agreement, and I just want to say thank you um, on behalf of any to the parties for, uh, for, for making something so significant and reflective of us as people. Kuinaini, thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Nadia Bouffard, uh, honored to join you from Canada. You have heard from a number of speakers about what a great accomplishment the Central Arctic Ocean Fisheries Agreement is. It continues to be a first in history where countries agree to prevent a problem before it actually occurs. This is a true exemplification of precautionary management. The 10 parties to the agreement elected me to chair the process to implement it. This work has been ongoing since 2018. The main objective of the agreement is as per its title, to prevent unregulated fishing in the high seas portion of the Central Arctic Ocean. Key to attaining this objective is to have knowledge and a good understanding of the Arctic ecosystems. The parties agreed to a framework for a joint program of scientific research and monitoring for which they're developing an implementation plan. 
As is the case for so many other topics in the Arctic, it's critical that all knowledge holders, whether they're scientific, indigenous, and local, share their knowledge, and equally critical for all involved to continue to cooperate to better understand the Central Arctic Ocean and the potential impacts that fishing can have on marine ecosystems. You've taken the first step by being here today and listening. I encourage you to continue your journey by staying engaged. If you want more information, you'll find some on the agreement website at vlab.noaa.gov web dash kaufa. Enjoy the rest of the conference. So we have four minutes left. And what did we talk about? You can see it up here. We had Dagur from Iceland, who has been sitting and drawing. Every time someone has been saying something, he has been drawing a summary. So you will find this online later. But before we start with the floor, I just want, because we have had a lot of speakers in a very short time. So Vicky, I just want to start with you, because we started with you. Could you elaborate a little bit more about WWF's role in the Central Arctic Ocean Fisheries Agreement? I really think you, you set the scene very well, but more precisely as an organization, what is your role and what is your input? Thank you, Mats. Thanks for that opportunity. I love this. So were those people way off to the right over there? that observer for CAUFA. <laughs> that, that's our role there. Uh, we, we are one of few organizations that are there um, as observers. Um, and obviously our purpose, our goal in doing that, is to really try to see, like I was saying at the beginning, can we meet the challenge of CAUFA? Its design is amazing. Now we have to make sure that the implementation happens and that those best parts of that design come through. So for us at WWF, we're working um, in CALFA at two different levels. One of them is, of course, looking at the fishery itself. Um, and so we are active within one of those scientific, I think I saw it there, scientific working groups around exploratory fishing and trying to come in there with our expertise, our knowledge, and seeing how we can contribute to those discussions. But we're also very active in the plenary and at the COPs themselves to be talking about and looking at the governance structure overall, and really trying to see how we're making sure that the CAUFA is going to continue to be a, in its way it's working, and as it's looking at things, that it's anticipatory towards this new future that's going to be coming into the Arctic and making sure it's taking into consideration all of those things in the designs, in the discussions, as these things become cemented. So we're working at it at both of these levels. Perfect, thank you. Now the challenge is, because I know that President Crimson will say we need to ask the audience for questions, and I have two minutes left. So raise your hand if you have a very quick questions that can be answered very quickly, if you have a question. No? Else I'm sure you can find all of these people around in the lobby in five minutes' time. So what is this? There's a question there. Please, yes, get the microphone down. And please introduce yourself, please. Thanks very much, Jim Gamble, Pacific Environment. Uh, Short question, that's the problem. <laughs> so, so Ambassador Balton said something really intriguing that the, the agreement is a, could be a model. Um, we have a new BB&J agreement, Biodiversity Beyond National Jurisdiction. We have all of these tools and the model. Is there something uh, that we can build for BB&J uh, from the agreement as a model? Just speculation on your part, I think, at this point, but it'd be interested to hear. That was nice and short. Yeah, Bolton, do you want, or anyone else? I'll give it a try, but there's no real short answer, Jim, to that question. <laughs> BB&J agreement isn't in force. When it enters into force, yes, it applies to the high seas area of the Central Arctic Ocean. Um, whether the COP, the BB&J COP, will consider that particular part of the planet as uh, one of the first, you know, in need of further protection, given the agreement is in place, is hard to say. And the main activity that might have gone on in the Central Arctic Ocean in the short term is fishing, and that is precluded by the agreement, at least as long as it lives. Um, so it's hard to know whether the COP might look at this BB, at the, the COFA agreement as sort of already solving a problem, and they may turn their attention to other things, or it could turn out differently. Could we give a round of applause to this panel? Because what they did was quite amazing. So thank you very much. Thank you.